This has been a period when lots of cultures uh, have been dealing with globalization and then wonder who they are. It is huge amounts of other people finding within Indian culture something that they respond to. And then you get to Bangkok. And suddenly it seems like everything's possible. You know, you have the transgender person waiting on you in the checkout line at the grocery store. Um, a lot of uh, people in uh, sexual minorities, uh, both gay and also transsexual people, are attracted to Hinduism. In This is Evil O from Udaipur, and once again, welcome to Dialogues. And today we have a very, very special guest, Philip Cornwell Smith, who may not be a well-known name in India, but he is extremely well-known in Thailand, especially Bangkok, I would say, but probably Thailand as a whole. He had a very, very well-known book published a number of years back called Very Thai, and he's just come out with a new book called Very Bangkok, but I would like to introduce Philip Cornwell-Smith. How are you today? I'm fine. Thank you very much for inviting me on your show. But you're, you're not in Thailand and Bangkok currently, are you? No, I'm one of those people who's stranded somewhere because of the, the airline crackdown, and uh, um, I was visiting my parents for their 80th birthdays, and... Mm -hmm. um, I decided to stay and shield them through this developing situation. And then all the airplanes uh, out of the skies and the, the rules stopped everyone flying in and out. And so I've been here for several months. Well, luckily I got stranded where I like to be, which is Udaipur. So I'm quite <laughs> fortunate that I'm stranded, but I still feel like I'm in prison. Well, anyway. I'm in the house where I grew up. And um, so that's a bit strange in a way to be here with one's parents in the house where you grew up in a Western context. This is the suburbia I ran away from. But actually these houses are all socially distanced from one another, like you find in suburbia. And it's a very good place to be in this situation. These are the suburbs of London, yes? Uh, not London, it's a dormitory town out, outside the Greenbelt. So it's, okay. um, it's on a motorway near lots of railway lines. It's, it's a place where lots of people who work in London uh, commute from. Okay. But, um, it's got a it's it's a very suburban corporate headquarters kind of town and uh, um, it, it's very leafy it's very green okay. well that's nice uh, well, let's so talk about your book let's 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 <laughs> talk about your book we've talked enough about our personal suffering <laughs> so tell us about your first book and you know remember my audience is mostly indian and most Indians that I know, they fly to Bangkok. You know, I meet them on the plane many times pre-COVID. And they always sort of break down into two groups, basically. You know, there's young Indian males who are basically going to Bangkok to have a good time. And they're also exciting, excited. And they can't, you know, wait to start drinking. They generally start before they board the plane, actually. And then, then there's Indian families who generally want nothing to do with Bangkok and they head right off to the beaches, to Krabi and wherever to enjoy the beach. But you're based in Bangkok. So anyway, let's just get to your first book, which is now in its 15th edition or something like something that. Something like that. A, a good, a good uh, dozen printings in hardback. Um, and you want to talk about that first book? A little yes. Bit? Um, very Thai was... Um, basically grew out of my experience working as the uh, founding editor of City Listings magazine in Bangkok. It was the first city magazine that Bangkok had. And so I was the center of a lot of questions about why is this like this? Why is that like that? And if it was where to go and hear jazz of an evening, I could answer or wh where a certain restaurant might be. But um, when it came to culture questions, I didn't always know the answer. I was fairly new myself. And... Uh, so I thought it would be interesting to do a book about the things that people uh, see everywhere, but don't know why they're like that. 
And um, so the subtitle of Veritai is called Everyday Popular Culture. So there was a threshold for including things that were not wholly traditional, not wholly modern. They were all some kind of hybrid um, that showed how Thai culture absorbed foreign influence, how Thai culture modernized within itself, and how it in many ways um, uh, dealt with things that were not necessarily from its original um, history, um, which is very interesting because Thai culture is not one of invention and originality, but its adaptation and uh, improvisation is their style. So the whole culture pretty much throughout history has been adapting other things to their taste and values. And so I just, I just watched your talk that you gave at the Practical Design Forum, I think it was, that talks on YouTube, and I watched it this morning, actually, to prepare for this a little bit. And it really struck me when you were talking about the whole thing that many times Thai people don't recognize culture as being a popular thing in the sense of the auto rickshaws that are used yeah. in Bangkok well, it, and how they it, different it, from the auto rickshaws in India, you know, yeah. um, but they think more of high culture. Well, I think there's a, a big division between definitions of culture. It's between in anthropology and in, uh, back in the 19th century, there was a division between Tyler who believed that culture was a manifestation of all the things that are in people's lives and how they operate and, uh, and function as a society. And then there's the Matthew Arnold style of culture, which is the, the, the best examples, the highest peak of abilities and artistry that man can do, mankind can do. And um, uh, so there's this division. In Thailand, the official culture is very much that high culture, um, things that you can present internationally as being the face of the culture to others, to show face, to gain face. And contrary to that, the everyday popular culture in, in Thailand is something that the elite has generally been ashamed of and doesn't want to present to the outside but world. But that's, that's exactly why your first book was so popular, because it wasn't just popular with foreigners. It was popular with Thai people, correct? Oh, absolutely. Because they recognized themselves in that book. It's like, yeah, this is us. Uh, yeah, it, it's very much the case. It has uh, groupies of Thais who are just fanatical about the book. I mean, it's, it's just time after time, I'll, uh, I'll come across a Thai who will then say, Very Thai is their favorite book. And uh, some of them talk about how it liberated them because when they wanted to do design or art or some kind of interiors or some event theming or, or advertising, they were always limited in making it, it make its Thai feeling be linked to the traditional up high class. Uh, culture. And so when you um, are suddenly presented with the lower class things, but in a high class format, so the, the, the hardback book published by in full color by a foreigner internationally, suddenly it's in a high class binding and presentational form. It liberated these people. That's what I've heard time and again. They felt free to use these icons of everyday culture in their uh, cre own creativity. And it coincided with the movement in Thailand towards that anyway. Um, there was a film that came out called Mana Korn or Citizen Dog. And it came out like three months after my book came out. And obviously the director had been um, looking at the same ideas I had in totally independently and separately. And so the book wrote a zeitgeist. And so it became the book of that whole movement. And so now it's quite iconic in itself. And, and very strangely, the book has been used as an art object by ties in exhibitions. They have really, it's been used as an, art as an artifact itself. It's very peculiar. But there was a professor in Chiang Mai in an exhibition on Thai works on paper. He just exhibited very Thai. Really? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, there was a venue in Bangkok that... Uh, uh, their installation was somebody reading through very Thai, Thai reading through very Thai. Really? So that's how much it's been ingrained in popular culture now in Thailand. Yes, Would that's right. That was, was only in Bangkok, basically, that it's so ingrained or throughout the country? Oh, throughout the country. But obviously, the, the biggest uh, concentration of people who work in creative professions, the, particularly uh, the highly educated 
part of the population is focused in Bangkok. Even if they study somewhere else, they're more likely to get jobs in Bangkok. So that's the focus of national life. And something I talk about in the new book is just how, how overly dominant Bangkok is within Thailand as a whole. Yeah, it's it most I get to that too. I noticed in your uh, talk on YouTube, also in the practical design form, I think it was, um, also you were um, mentioning a group of books about England, about the English. Mm. And they were all, except for one of them, all of them were written by foreigners in the sense they were written by French or German or whatever, but they all became sort of classic books on the English people or English culture, if I am not mistaken. Well, well I think um, the interesting aspect of that is that in, within Thailand, there is a huge discussion about what Thainess means and what it is, because it's, a, it's an ideology forced on the people, basically. It's not something that they would necessarily describe themselves as. It's aspirational, it's didactic, it's telling people how they should be. So it's a very much of a top-down um, uh, rules of propriety, basically. And I say to, when I'm giving talks in Thailand, I say that in England, we've got a, a, a question about what is English as opposed to what is British. And this was before Brexit happened, but Brexit has only reinforced this, that there is a, a difference between the regions of this country and the whole national identity. Right. And so these books about Englishness, which have been published over the last 15, 20 years, they're published, some by foreigners, but many of them are by English people who've lived abroad or they're by people from Zimbabwe or Scots or, or uh, um, in the case of the best one, Claire Fox's book, um, Watching the English, she grew up with her father, who was an anthropologist, studying the tribes of Papua New Guinea. And so when she came back to England, she noticed the, um, uh, the tribal characteristics of the English because she'd been raised with looking at the world that way and right. so we talked about the way the english uh, garden and treat their dogs and treat their people and go to the pub and like uh, and any good anthropologist would things. do yes okay. uh, so i think that it's a uh, this has been a period when lots of cultures uh, have been dealing with globalization and then wonder who they are because they've modernized over previous decades and haven't necessarily um kept a, a a fully traditional view of themselves in that period. They've often, uh, in, in the Thai case, during the boom period, the Asian tiger boom of the 18, eight, 1980s and 90s, they were uh, shunning anything traditional and embracing anything modern or imported. And so we've since about, I think it's really since the, the 1997 economic crash that Thailand started, but which had many effects around the region in, in Indonesia and Korea and places especially. Um, and that uh, brought a, a stronger sense of questioning what is the national identity, what is the local identity of different um, communities in Asia. And I say communities rather than nations because that also coincides with a upspring in, say, for example, pride in being from Isan, pride in being from the north of Thailand. It begins so provincial is what she tried to pretend that everyone in Thailand was equal. They were all Thai, and you couldn't even, for a period, describe someone as being from northern Thailand or southern Thailand. No, a Thai was from Thailand. But and there's a big difference between northern Thailand and oh, southern Thailand. there is. So Thailand. this is an example of how the imposed Thainess differs from how people would describe themselves or describe others within the culture. So there's, a, there's this difference between the official version and the reality. And that underpins both very Thai and very Bangkok because there's a huge amount to discuss. Well, I'm amazed. <clears throat> I just have to cut in a little bit, but I mean, I'm amazed that a foreigner such as yourself could move to Thailand 25 years ago and write a book that has just become so incorporated into popular Thai culture now. You know, it's not a lonely planet guide by any means. You know, it's something yeah. that local Thais love. It's been translated into Thai, correct? It hasn't actually. It um, hasn't, really. Uh, well, it's quite interesting. When you go back to, to when the book came out in the mid-2000s, um, I remember my publisher saying, you do know people are going to attack you. 
Yes, of course. What we had in mind were the uh, self-appointed and also the appointed guardians of the culture, a certain echelon of people within the culture who tend to uh, find themselves uh, appointed to committees of this and ranks of that. And they, they are telling, they're the people who are telling people what time it should be. Um, and so in a sense, somebody else saying these things is breaking a bit of a taboo because it's not just a question about talking about the subject matter. It's also about who gets to talk about these things. Yes, of course. So, I mean, um, we've got the same thing here. I mean, so basically you have somebody like Modi or certain guardians of the culture, you are oh, decreeing this is Indianness, this is Hinduism, the way it is perceived through them. And then you have little localized people saying, no, it's not. We've always done it like this. And then yeah. somebody like a Sheldon Pollock or Wendy Doniker comes in and releases a book and all hell breaks loose because it's like, well, what the hell does this person from Chicago know, you, if you understand? But, um, but you've avoided that somehow. But yours um, is more well, light. It's not a scholarly book. It's a pop book, I would say. Well, you say it's not a scholarly book, but it's um, used in universities an awful lot. That's um, it, really? Okay. Oh, yes. <laughs> um, uh, someone at a university that's famous for its Southeast Asian studies said that he became aware of the book indirectly because one year, lots of his um, PhD and master's students were... Um, suddenly there was something in common between all of their thesis choices, but he couldn't quite work out what it was. And it turned out that uh, Very Thai had been got hold of by somebody in the, in the faculty, and the book had spread through the undergraduates, and they were all taking topics out of it to explore further in their degree. <laughs> so um, I, I, know, I know you're really <laughs> eager to start talking about your new book. But before we go there, just because I largely have an Indian audience, yeah. we were talking one day about the connections that hold Thailand and India together historically. Yes. There are so many. And we, we range, I mean, this is, you know, for people who don't know, but Philip and I have gotten together my little office in Thailand in what I call my hole, <laughs> <laughs> having gin and tonics in the past, talking about these things. But... Um, one of the things you had mentioned is that you observed that the Thai seems Thai seem to be much more, oh, I want to use the word obedient or respectful toward authority, whereas Indians are known to be the argumentative Indians who love to question everything and argue about everything, and they don't accept authority so easily at all. And you were wondering if that was due to the fact that only the Ramayana made it into Thailand and not the Mahabharata. Interesting. You want to you talk about that. that? Remember that conversation? Do you want yeah. to talk about that at all? Because the Mahabharata is a much more argumentative book, the way I understand it. Whereas I'm the Ramayana is a pretty on... set linear story. But... I'm not an authority on the Mahabharata, but it, this is something that occurred to me. It's a, uh, how to say, it, uh, it's not a theory of mine. Let's say that I've put that premise out there okay. for. Um, maybe people to ponder. Um, the, the Ramayana is very much about righteousness and rules and the good person does the right thing, even if it's, uh, it's, even if it's a, um, uh, an act that, that might shock people, you know, they stick by the rules. Um, whereas I understand the Mahabharata is much more that um, the good people do bad things, the bad people can do good things, and there's much uh, gray. There's a lot more philosophy in it in gray areas. Yes. yes. The way um, and there are the odd characters from the Mahabharata that have made it into Thailand, but they're not very strong. The overwhelming influences of the Ramayana and the kings are named after uh, Rama, the um, so many uh, parts of the traditional arts are based on the Ramayana stories and not so much the Mahabharata or even many other um, epic poetry from history. Well, but the first thing the Indians on a plane notice when they land in Thailand is that the airport is, uh, well, there's Swavabhumi, if I'm saying it right, is the Sanskrit name for golden land. That's right, yes. People comment on that as soon as they land. Oh, that's Sanskrit. That's right. And um, well, how, how deep are these historical ties between Thailand and India? Well, 
Thailand is actually part of what we'd call Indochina. And although we tend to think of Indochina these days as being only the French colonial part of uh, uh, Vietnam, Cambodia, Laos, uh, Siam also was Indochina. It's got the same uh, cultural flows going through it. And also it's an area of intersection with the Malay world. Um, and historically, all those flows were by sea and up rivers. Uh, it's a very riverine part of the world. And so there was lots of big navigable rivers, but there was a lot of mountains around it. So you didn't get much um, travel from India to Thailand or Siam as it was over land, but there was a lot of trade from Southern India, particularly to the peninsula. Um, and uh, that I understand is one of the ways in which the, um, uh, the roots of the Brahmin priests uh, lineage, which is about 1500 years old, came from southern India, and those families in Bangkok that are still Brahmin priests are, are descended from that, plus a few more came in, in, uh, in other periods. Yeah, I was talking to my friend Pankaj Kerr the other day on this channel, and his grandfather used to be the Maharaja of Tripura, mm -hmm. I guess it is, and uh, he mentioned that some princess in Assam or something was married off to the Thai king at some point in history. But he claimed there was actually a linguistic connection between the word Assam and Siam. Oh, very likely, because there are definitely uh, ethnically Thai people who live in Assam, as in Shan state and Shan Siam, it's the same word, basically. Um, and also into northern Vietnam. And there's some dispute. Some people think that the, the, the Thai people came from northern Vietnam area rather than southern China. It's a bit vague and um, it's not entirely clear because they didn't have so many records or they were on, uh, on um, perishable materials. Right. Um, so there's um, obviously a very strong Indian uh, origin to the belief system, Buddhism, um, but it was Mahayana before it became Theravada. It was uh, the Theravada um, system now it was fed in from Sri Lanka uh, several hundred years ago. But um, going back 2000 years, it was um, a, a Mon culture basically that was um, across central Thailand. It was the Mons and the Khmers and they were Mahayana. Uh, infused with Hinduism and all, all these different things together. Bang, it, was, it still has some grand Hindu temples in it. Quite uh, old, it, correct? It's got Indian style features in lots of Thai temples, and it does have some Indian temples. Um, now, the Indian temples tend to be based around particular communities of Indians from different parts of India. And okay. this is one of the things I explored in very Bangkok where I looked at where different groups settled in Bangkok and, and their, their histories. And um, for example, in Ceylon, what people call the, the, the Indian temple is actually a South Indian temple from Tamils. It, it looks like a South Indian temple. Yes, it, very it is so, very yeah. much that style. But the South Indians were working for British companies because that temple is in a sector of the city that was reserved for... Um, the Europeans. Now, the Thai way of organizing uh, their society was, was cantonment, basically separating different ethnic groups into their own villages, um, usually with an, a narrow way in and a narrow way out, sort of, they're a community, not a through way. And right. so this, this affected how the city grew because you've got uh, very narrow lanes going into communities that don't interconnect and they're in parallel without cut throughs and they'll come out onto huge major roads. So this is a, a problem of urban navigation and traffic nowadays, but it comes from the way that different ethnic groups were kept separately. And so the, the British companies in the international European quarter, um, they were hiring um, uh, Tamils for various jobs in their companies, and they also hired Sikhs to be security. Okay. Um, and you could still see that at the Oriental Hotel. Not that long ago, they still had a Sikh um, head of the... Uh, well, the Sikhs are always known for being martial in their abilities. 
Exactly. It, it was very much like the Raffles Hotel in Singapore, where there's a Sikh and a Grand Turban, um, who's the, the head of the, 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 the people greeting at the hotel. It's very right. much a first impression. And so there's another Hindu temple, um, not far from that one, which is from um, uh, northern Ganges Valley kind of area, the people from that part of India, they go there and they dress very differently. They, their festivals on the same night will be totally different in social style, the way they're dressed, the, the, the tone. Uh, in in the, the South Indian uh, temple, it's filled with people in trance. It's, it's much more colorful, louder, more um, uh, vibrant and uh, kind of chaotic. But the well, that's the same way. That's the way it is in India. The North Indian celebrations are much more vibrant and chaotic, as you put it. <laughs> well, the, I mean, I always, when people come to India, they want to celebrate Holi, and they say, well, I'm going to go to Goa for Holi. It's like, well, there is no Goa in Holi. And I mean, there is a Holi in Goa, by and large. You have to come to Rajasthan or someplace to right. enjoy it. Well, it, the, it might reflect the, the businesses that those people have gone into. Uh, the people in the um, northern Indian temple, um, a lot of them are more business people, Indian business people, with um, a uh, much, it's much more like business wear. They're, they're very presentable dinner party clothing or sort of a married, clo type of clothing that people might wear to a grand occasion. Uh, the other thing about the Hindu temple in, in, in Ceylon, the, the southern Indian one, is that it draws hundreds of thousands of Thai devotees, including a lot of Sino Thais. And so it's not just Indians there. It is huge amounts of other people finding within Indian culture something that they respond to. And uh, one of the features of that, you see all around the, the, the block that the, the temple's on, the block goes for a couple of kilometers, there's scores of, se of separate shrines that people have set up and the public come to uh, bring their um, images of Hindu gods to recharge their spiritual power in those festivals. Right. So, and then they take them back to their home altars. And a lot of people have looked at why is Hinduism on the rise among Thais? And it is. And it's oh, it is. Okay, that's interesting. Oh, it's, yes, it's, um, it's a, quite a phenomenon. And it's particularly among younger ties, particularly people in creative professions. Also, um, this might be discomforting. Are you, saying, are you saying people born into Buddhist families are, are going more yeah. towards Hinduism now? Really? Oh, yes. I I, I've, I've got a friend who um, he decided to um, change his name and his religion on his identity card. And he really? worked in a Hindu shop and he eventually moved to Europe, but he still kept his his, um, his uh, own Hindu identity. Dropped the yes, exactly. Why is uh, that? What is what is fueling that move? Well, I think it's because state Buddhism in Thailand is very uh, has become denatured. The official it, it's the same division again. The official Buddhism is very formal and, uh, and strict and talked about in terms of righteousness and morality. And then the everyday Buddhism is a practical way of coping with life and managing social affairs and, uh, and dealing with morality on a, a more practical basis. And it's incorporated with Hinduism, Brahmanism, uh, animism, and all sorts of other things because Thais incorporate gods like um, Guan Im, the Chinese god. She's often on Thai altars. And uh, so... There's a, a phrase that was explained to me um, when I looked at Thai fortune telling, because Thai fortune telling includes the European system uh, of astrology, tarot cards, Indian astrology, Chinese astrology, uh, Chinese uh, face reading, um, indigenous um, kind of soothsaying ideas and uh, all kinds of multiple different things. And the, the, the principle behind it is that um, whatever gets the best fortune, <laughs> if, if one system doesn't work, but you try again with another system. I was going to uh, say, you can't go wrong when you've got all of that going absolutely. for you. And, 
<laughs> Thailand's a country where they like to have as many options kept open for as long as possible. So um, there could be more than one outcome in any situation. And by consulting different fortune tellers, they can see the range of the possibilities that might happen. And so this is how uh, this Indian side of culture comes into contemporary Thai culture, because the this dry, very formal, detached state Buddhism that's run a bit like a bureaucracy doesn't speak to the heart of ordinary people. Yes. Which is why a lot of Buddhists now don't go to, to Buddhist temples to do their meditation. They go to meditation retreats and they're doing almost like a secular Buddhism. I, maybe that's not quite the right word, but they're, they're going to non-religious establishments to do spiritual things. And it's partly in a similar way to Westerners do this sort of thing. But this is Thai Buddhists not going to temples as much as going to uh, retreats to do their meditation. That, that is shocking to me. I didn't know that at all. I didn't know um, that at all. I didn't yes, know that at all. It's quite shocking to me. And, and there's another aspect which uh, may also discomfort some people. Um, a lot of uh, people in uh, sexual minorities, uh, both gay and also transsexual people, are attracted to Hinduism in Thailand because there are a variety of gods and they all have quite strong personalities. Yes. They have characteristics and some of them transform. Yes. Th th these gods have multiple different avatars. So the, this idea of a transforming god that's got attributes that you can identify with is something that um, individual minority groups in Thailand, um, which also include creative people who are just feel like misfits in a very formal culture, um, they find in Hinduism uh, a scope for something that means something to them, sort of, uh, if you like, moral role models that are different from the mainstream in their own country, but which um, they can navigate life with. Interesting. Yeah, I always say that polytheism is rather nice compared to monotheism because if you don't like one God, you can pick another. You know, it's one doesn't work, you go to the next, yeah. putting it bluntly. Um, but you brought up something which I'm sure many Indians are going to be curious about because India is very, very sexually conservative for the most part. Now, you know, obviously you've got like the Bollywood film sexuality that goes on, but that's a typical, and you know, your average Indian will say, well, that's a fantasy. They enjoy it because it's a fantasy, but you couldn't possibly live like that in real life, you know? And then you get to Bangkok, and suddenly it seems like everything's possible. You know, you have the transgender person waiting on you in the checkout line at the grocery store. You've got the gay district. You have, you know, the red light district. Um, all of this stuff. You've got dance clubs, you know, boys and girls dancing together, which, like, you know, doesn't happen in India by and large. Like, um, you want to comment on why you think that is? Why was there such... Uh, sexual libertarianism, I guess I want to use the word, in Thailand as opposed to India? Well, I think the foundation of it is the, there's a feeling among Thais that, well, about freedom. Individually, Thais cherish freedom. And this is built into the definition of Thai. I mean, it's, may, it's maybe a bit invented, but Thai meaning free. Um, this was coined, in a sense, in the way that Thais were never colonized by Europeans. So there's this element of it being a bit propagandistic, oh, we were, uh, our name means free. But Thais do take it to heart, and they are very um, individualistic by, by Asian standards. And I think this is one, something that comes across in, in the Thai soap operas. They've proven very popular internationally because they're, they're they're quite emotional um, and they're quite uh, uh, individualistic. And I think that there's a sense in which you, you also are always aware that you don't want somebody who's pow more powerful than you to cause you harm. So there is a sense of placating 
uh, dangerous people, just as there is placating dangerous bad spirits with okay. offerings. And this runs through the whole culture. So uh, pe- one reason ties are um, on first encounter and, and many other encounters so friendly and pleasant and open is because they they don't know who they're dealing with yet and they don't want to they don't want to uh have some hostage to fortune in something they said when they first meet somebody they they're very polite and have very strong manners at the at, 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 um uh in their their interactions and they also don't want to uh, they don't dare restrict somebody because they don't know if they might be connected to some powerful person that can come back to them and cause them trouble. So there is a tendency to avoid inconveniencing others. This is the ethic known as Greng Jai. Um, and it's also partly fear-based in that you, you don't want to risk anything. And the upshot of that is that you allow people to have personal freedom, even if the, the social face is very prim. So in very Bangkok, I, I describe the chapter um, that's called libido. I, I call it sin city meets prim city. So people can do whatever they like behind the scenes. It's private and private life is viewed as, as private. And that also causes problems sometimes with things like domestic violence being only classified as a private matter rather than a law and order public affairs matter. Um, and in public, everyone is very proper, but an awful lot of those people being proper have got a minor wife or they've got... Uh, um, I read a book um, many, many, many years ago, many years ago, that was about sexuality around the world. And one of the things it said in the chapter on Thailand that in Thailand, nearly all husbands kept either a mistress or a male lover on the side. And the wives generally knew it was no problem, but it was never to be spoken about. You know, it well, was I don't know about spoken. that. It's, it's a reflection of wealth and the ability yeah. to have uh, a mistress on the side or a minor wife shows a level of status and power. And that's one reason that keeps it going as a phenomenon. If you can afford to have more than one household going, it shows that you're a person of means. Um, but I think that there's a lot more uh, disquiet among women about men that do that. Um, and also there's, um, there's, it is talked about because usually the first wife um, will have to consent to the second wife. Ah, okay. The first wife, she get, her side of the bargain is that she gets to have, if you like, more power over the prime household. And the minor wife is for fun only, but she shouldn't get above her station. So it's right. about the, the minor wife getting to her to big ideas above her position within the hierarchy within the family. Um, but sometimes it's not known about. And um, it, it's a phenomenon that does continue. And I would say that ethically, there's a lot more scolding of that kind of situation in the time I've seen in Thailand. Uh, and I think a lot of Thai Chinese uh, who form the core of the middle class in Bangkok, they are more strict and, and more, um, they present a more a kind of a sense of ethics about it. Uh, and they set the tone for a lot of things because they run the business and the media and, and so forth. So, so when you think about things as the red light districts, did a lot of that grow up around the Vietnam War times when Bangkok was basically an R and R place for American GIs, or did it, it predate that? It did, um, the, but the one of the the uh, the false histories that's come out is the way that it's very convenient to blame all of this amorality on Westerners coming into Siam and doing these terrible amoral things. But of course, as you say that it was there before. And um, of course, this is the oldest profession in the world is uh, servicing uh, the needs of, uh, of people's libidos. And um, when we go back to the 19th century through to the early 20th century, we find 
hundreds of thousands into the millions of single male Chinese immigrants into Thailand, most of them into Bangkok or through Bangkok. And because Imperial China would refuse to allow Chinese women to go off to find work in that period, it was only males that came out. And there's, so there weren't obviously uh, the same number of available women around. Right. And so there was um, entrepreneurs <laughs> among them found ways to uh, um, service the needs of those um, those single males who were either sojourning or they would some were coolies, some were people doing trade at a higher level, but they were all obviously had needs and uh, urges and and lonely. And it, there's it's very interesting in nine, in the nineteen twenties, which was probably the freest period in Thai media. Um, there were cartoons in the newspapers showing um, a Thai dancer on a pedestal. Uh, and no, nobody in the audience looking at her. And then they were all looking at the exotic dancer on the, the next pedestal. <laughs> and this was in a Chinatown um, cabaret. So even in the 1920s, you've got this same dichotomy that people talk about with the, oh, don't look at Pat Pong, look at the traditional Thai dancer in the temple kind of thing. Um, right. There's that same... Uh, contrast was being drawn by people because well, of I read a book and I forget who the author was. I read a book about a gentleman traveler through Indochine in the 1920s. And he makes a big point that when he gets to Siam and he gets to Bangkok and, you know, okay, so Siam was never colonized. Right. But he makes a big point that he is surprised at how all of the women wear Western dress. They didn't wear native costume. They all wore Western dress. And this was back in the 1920s. But they weren't colonized. So why is that? Why did Thai sort of gravitate towards wanting to appear like Europeans in many Well, ways? this is um, uh, it's something that Thais are quite proud about because at the height of the imperial uh, rush for colonies, Siam was vulnerable and was um, intimidated. Um, and forced into unequal treaties with um, extraterritoriality for uh, foreigners within Thailand who were not were not under the legal system of Thailand, but under the legal system of foreign countries. And so there was a lot of um, concern that Siam would be the next colony. And one of the uh, uh, genius ways in which Thais managed to avoid that was to uh, take on aspects of the civilization that they could see in the foreign countries. And the, the king uh, of that period, his name was Chulalongkorn or Rama V, he went traveling abroad. Uh, he first of all, he went to British colonies like um, uh, Singapore. He also went to Java, the Dutch colony of J Java. And he saw how uh, Western colonies were run. And then he went to Europe mostly the rising countries like uh, Russia and, and Germany and, and so forth, Italy, um, uh, to see how they were dealing with their own national uh, stories because they were newly united in many ways. Um, and then later he went to Britain and France and saw the, the biggest powers of the day. But he, 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 he waited until uh, he had already had a chance to modernize Siam before going to Britain and France to show how much of an equal he was. Okay. And the, the cleverness of this was that a lot of the discourse by the Christians um, was about uncivilized people that, they, uh, that, that colonialism was bringing civilization to. And uh, Siam, and also this is true of Japan, um, they both, those two countries, both modernized themselves without prompting. And they both, by the 1920s, those two countries are the most advanced in Asia in terms of things like trains and trams. So they basically and, uh, played the game that we already are civilized, we don't need you, because we exactly. appear to be Europeans. And so part of that involved dressing in a Western way. And this has been a recurrent theme in, in Thai history. Um, in that period of the 19th century through to the 20s and so on, it was 
uh, influence from the elite first. So uh, royal family members, aristocratic members, and also um, there was a whole echelon of um, the best and brightest from all over the country were sent off on scholarships to study in the West um, by the king. And some of those came back and uh, caused a revolution in 1932. Um, but uh, those people, all of those people, were we wearing Western clothes and adopting Western uh, styles. And even when you look at traditional Thai costumes, the national costume styles, they've, they've got these Western elements in them, like shoes and socks, which is not something that Thais naturally wear. And then when it comes to the, the 1940s, there was some what they call cultural mandates. Uh, it was a, um, a long list of rules about how to behave and how to be Thai. And being Thai meant not wearing traditional clothing, like uh, um, sarongs and uh, the breast wraps and things like this. Um, being Thai meant wearing um, shoes and socks and a hat and a jacket and a, a safari suit or whatever it was, a, a prim skirt uh, as opposed to uh, a sarong. So the same thing, I, Thais eating with spoons and forks rather than with chopsticks. I heard this story. Well, well. that was a different, that's a very different story, actually. But it's uh, it, from the early days of that period when King Rama IV um, the story goes that he invited uh, an American um, missionary, Dr. Dan Beach Bradley, to the palace for breakfast. And he went to the, uh, went to the palace and there, were, there was this beautiful table all laid out with Western cutlery and crockery and all of this. And um, they, they started breakfast and then the reverend realized that he was the only one eating. And he'd been invited along to give a demonstration of how, how you use cutlery. <laughs> okay. okay. <laughs> and um, so the idea was that they knew Westerners use cutlery um, and that they wanted to learn. And, and so the, I think initially they did have all of the cutlery, including knives, but they uh, no longer used the knives because it suited Thai food to use just the spoon and the fork. Right. So the thing uh, I always notice when I'm there that I never get a knife. Where's my knife? <laughs> <laughs> okay, you've been waiting, I know. Let's just it's getting we've talked a long time. Let's talk about your new book. I know you've been working on this book for ten years. Something since like Very it. High came out and you finally got Very Bangkok out. So why don't you tell us what is Very Bangkok and how does it differ from Very Thai? Okay, well, I came to realize that um, I'm a writer living in this city that I, that my adopted home, and I come to know an awful lot about it. It had been my job to know about it for the, uh, I mean, since I first arrived in 1994, I was the, it was my job to do that as the editor of the City Listings magazine. I also worked on guidebooks, uh, which I edited, um, and and they were focused on the city. So I looked at the city from many different directions. And in some ways, I had been um, sorting the city according to outside principles. So in a city magazine, it's, it's arranged by genre, category of activity. Then in guidebooks, it's arranged by area and by um, how tourists might access it for different services. Um, and I thought about, I, I had to write a book about Bangkok. I knew I had to. And it, it occurred to me that I should be looking at Bangkok from how it's um, something that's inside the city in, in its ways of, uh, of being that isn't so um, trying to, to slice and dice it according to these very standard formats. Right? It's a very Western way is to, to do essentialism so the, uh, just by different, different categories. And so what was different in this book, I decided to look at, uh, cut across that by looking at a, from another perspective that was, we've all got in common, that everyone can relate to, but is not based on categorization. And that is to look at it through the senses. Now there are about 24 senses, depending on how you count them. Um, there's two to do with sight alone. It's not just the form that we look at, but also color. 
but there's many other senses like say balance or direction and when you look at uh, a city through these um, these ways of experiencing it um, you, you notice that this culture Thai culture treats some of these things very differently than other cultures do it turns out that there's an awful lot of beliefs relating to um, say direction it's a very rich topic as it turned out and there's a lot of variety in the ways that Thais express direction within the culture and within the signage and lots of different forms and then something like balance is noticed an awful lot by Thais because they are brought up with very strict ways about holding themselves uh, to be polite so there's a lot of ways of, of um, when you, you greet people, your, how your body language is held with different status, how you give something to somebody, how you pass something, how you um, pray to different, how you prostrate, um, how ties move, they're taught to walk softly, um, all this kinds of thing. Um, so suddenly looking at a topic called balance, it opens up uh, another way of looking at the culture. And then you realize that a lot of the signifiers of Thainess like Thai boxing and Thai dance, these are hugely balance-based activities. Mm. And um, so it's, a, it's about taking you out of rigid ways of thinking and to looking at the experience of it. Um, and so that I picked about 20 different senses, the last one of which is sensors, which is digital sensing, which is another way to bring in an aspect about when, how bank different senses i thought there were only five no 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 there's there's many <laughs> and not and just the six senses um oh it's it's quite fascinating when you we have our bodies all have different kinds of You're sounding music. like a uh, hindu guru now <laughs> any sorts of so many 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 well actually there's um in the introduction i i do talk about one of the most famous uh, monks in Thailand, Luang Por To, who's most famous for being the exorcist of a famous ghost called Mena Prakanong or Nang Nag. She was a, a, a woman who died in childbirth and she became this famous ghost. And there's a temple in um, uh, eastern Bangkok where she's um, worshipped uh, still. And this monk, in something that's lesser known, he uh, conceived of a thing called a six panel mirror. Now, when we use a mirror, we tend to think of our face and we do the face dominates, right? Right. And, and particularly in the face culture. But he conceived of a mirror that's got panels at the side and at the back and above and below. So you should look at everything from the point of view of many different sides that you don't normally consider and also the low as well as the high and so forth. And then he matched each of these mirrors with one of the sensors mind being the top one. Um, so he looked at the senses as being a way to understand things. Um, it's not just in, in Buddhism a sense of quelling the senses and wisdom comes from not following the senses. He was pointing out how the senses can tell us all sorts of things and when we make our, you know, our own ethical or moral judgments based on those things, but what we, we learn from the senses a lot more than we might expect. Okay, so you have this different way of approach. Do you still go into the pop cultural? Oh, yes. Of Bangkok? So, so this is, um, the book has got many different threads, one of which is looking at the popular culture. Another one is looking at um, urbanism, about how Bangkok works as a city. Uh, lots of things to do with how it functions and its layout and its types of buildings and its... Um, the way that they don't like open space in Thailand, everything's very cramped in together and all this types of thing. Um, so the first section is, is experiential. It's the sensory section. Then the, the middle section is to do with um, the social heart of the culture. So I look into things to do with, with identity, to do with community, um, subcultures, um, creativity, youth culture, um, ethnic differences, um, all these kinds of things. Um, and then the last section um, is to do with the presentation of the culture and reflections on it by 
uh, ties within the culture or different types of ties, not just the formal, but also many other levels. And then how it's seen from outside, how it's presented to tourists, also how it's thought about academically. There's been a huge increase in this thing called Thai studies all over the world. Thailand is now a subject of study, which discomforts a lot of people, particularly those that want to set a, um, tell people how Thailand should be. They yes. really dislike this, um, all this open thing. <laughs> and also, also it's Thais talking widely about their own culture, which is also not welcome in some places. Um, so uh, then I look at also how the city has been represented in all these different art forms, whether it's um, fine art, film, literature, um, TV, documentaries, soap operas, you name it, all these different characteristics. And so you go from the, uh, from the immediate immersion into discovering something deeper and then reflecting on it as you go through the book. And the coverage is immense. I mean, it really does cover pretty much every aspect of life in the city. So that's one reason it took so long is because I had to immerse in each of those areas. And some I knew better than others. Can you, can you explain, this is probably way off topic, can you explain why Thai rickshaws are so different than Indian rickshaws? I mean, Indian rickshaws are just sort of totally functional and clunky, and they get you from one place to another. And most Indians would agree with me. But you go to Bangkok, and they're like little movable discos with flashing lights. They're much more open. You get a breeze. You get music. You get flashing lights at night. I mean, they're fun. Why? So you're talking about auto rickshaws, the tuk -tuk. Auto rickshaws, yes, yes, the tuk-tuks. Well, I mean, it's one thing that's quite interesting is after the 1997 crash, um, suddenly you started to get the word Thailand in the Thai national colours embossed and written and painted on the back panel of the tuk-tuk, um, uh, the word Thailand, whereas before the economic crash, it had the name of the Japanese manufacturer. Okay, yes. So there's this sense in which a lot of things that come from outside are represented by Thais as something that's Thai. Now, I, I often talk about tuk-tuks in international talks and also talks with Thais because tuk-tuks are in 34 countries, at least 34 countries on five continents. Right. And um, so I've seen them in Africa, they're in the Caribbean, they're in all over Asia, they're in parts of Europe. Um, and I, I, I agree, the Indian style ones and say Indonesian style ones are very utilitarian. And the Thai, the Thai Tuk Tuk, although it's a very short vehicle and quite stubby, is remarkably elegant. Oh, it is. They're very elegant. Yeah. And um, it's fascinating when you compare it to the Thai style of buffalo carts or horse carts okay. and also to um, long tail boats. They've got the same type of curved roof. They've got um, decorative panels that, that are very similar to what was found on ox carts. So they've taken the form and shape, including these swooping lines and put them on something really tiny like the tuk-tuk and made it into quite an elegant vehicle. So although it's, um, it's only a version of a Japanese auto rickshaw, which is a version of an Italian post-war car, in fact. Is it Mitsubishi or something, or what, what was well, it? In the yeah, there's, there's various different manufacturers, did okay. them, including Mitsubishi. Um, Daihatsu, and um, there was another one, I forget this name, but uh, they originally started in Italy. But the, the Thai Tuk Tuk is the most beautiful of them, probably. Um, oh, yeah. I love Thai. I love Thai tuk-tuks. I yeah, always I call them rickshaws because here we just call them rickshaws or autos. All right. Yeah. yeah. Well, it's a, it's a classic hybrid. So it's a, a, a mixture of lots of things that Thais then think of as Thai. So very many things that are thought of as Thai, or even get the label Thai, like Muay Thai boxing, right? Yes, Muay Thai. You know, Muay Thai boxing only got the name Muay Thai when it incorporated the British Queensbury rules of boxing. Okay. <laughs> it was never called Muay Thai before that because there was lots of different martial arts. Uh, there was Muay Chaya, Muay Korat, Muay Khmer from C Cambodia, many different variants. 
they combine them together and then they can put them with uh, uh, the Queensby rules, which is having a ring of four sides with a blue corner and a red corner and rounds of three minutes with a bell and all these kinds of things of boxing gloves. So then it became Muay Thai. Right, right, right. Yeah, so it's quite interesting how that's developed. And generally anything that's got the word Thai on it, as its name, like Pad Thai noodles, invariably means it comes from another culture and they're trying okay. to... Uh, so it's a, way of, it's a way of claiming it by adding the Thai to it. Yeah. So, Philip, I think we've probably talked long enough. Do you want to say anything more about your book? Well, um, this is the book. Uh, show it. Okay. It, it's available send internationally. Me an image. You send me an image and I will stick it right in the intro too so people can see it. I will do. Um, it is available internationally and I did see that there's an Indian um, bookseller uh, online that's, that's selling it at the moment and it's in the Americas, in Europe, in, across Asia. Um, and uh, it's. Uh, I, I also devised the book as something that's got some um, time, uh, it, it's, it's a bit insured against becoming dated. Um, when I was looking at other ways of presenting the city, uh, they're dated by events. And Thailand's a very fast moving culture and Bangkok changes fundamentally many ways. I've seen it through about five or six different phases in the 25 years I've been there. But I decided in this book to look at the um, the reasons why it is the way it is. So even if the example changes, even if a, a building's knocked down and replaced with another one, the thing is they will spring from the same source of the way of looking, the way of the, the cultural triggers, they will still be the same. That, that's what's consistent. The, same. the quote unquote tiness. Yes. The tiness. Philip Cornwell Smith, nice talking to you. I hope we can meet again and have gin and tonic in my little hole in Bangkok <laughs> that I keep that you know well. And um, until then, thank you for being a part of this. So bye from Eva Lowe. Say goodbye. Bye. Bye-bye. <laughs> bye. I had to cut this, otherwise it's just going to get too long. But it really was enjoyable talking to you. It was quite good. Okay.